Welcome back. In the last video, we talked about um, a little bit of more detail on carbon dioxide transport, and we looked at something called the Haldane effect. Um, in this video, we're going to go into cooperativity. So let me write that here. We're going to we're going to study cooperativity. Okay. And all cooperativity is, is it means that the binding of one ligand to a protein influences the binding of the next ligand, okay? And so we have two types of cooperativity. We have positive cooperativity and we have negative cooperativity, okay? So negative cooperativity is not exhibited by hemoglobin. Negative cooperativity would mean that the binding of the first ligand makes it less favorable for the binding of the second. And so binding of the second would make it less favorable for the binding of the third and so forth, okay? But hemoglobin exhibits something called positive cooperativity. So this is, this is what hemoglobin has. And so it, positive cooperativity is the exact opposite of negative, okay? It just means that binding of the first ligand makes it more favorable for the binding of the second to bind, right? Binding of the second makes it more favorable for the binding of the third. Binding of the third makes it more favorable for the binding of the fourth. And that's the limit, right? Because hemoglobin can only bind four oxygens, right? Only binds four, so you basically do it up to four, right? But the binding of each subsequent uh, oxygen makes it more favorable for the next one to bind. And so oxygen, we're going to make a term here. This is called the ligand, okay? So generally you have a ligand, and a ligand is just something that binds to either a receptor or a cofactor or um, some kind of protein. The ligand is just what binds, and so our ligand in this case is going to be oxygen. So whenever I say ligand, that's what I'm referring to. It's just something that binds to the protein in some way. Um, if you had a, a neurotransmitter, that would be the ligand for its particular receptor. Um, there are lots of types of ligands that we can have, but in the case of hemoglobin, it's oxygen. Okay. So we have to come back here and we have to look at our tetrameric structure, okay? So recall that hemoglobin is a tetramer, right? And recall that each one of these, uh, um, uh, these tertiary structures can bind an oxygen. So initially one is going to bind, and, and based on our logic um, of positive cooperativity, that's going to be the one that's most difficult to bind. And I hope that makes sense. But to really get an intuitive feel of what's happening, we really have to look at the porphyrin ring itself. So we're always going to come back to this. That's why understanding your structures is very important in biochemistry. Okay. And then we have our histidine residue down here. Right. So there's your histidine. Right. And here's the rest of the protein chain. Right. Okay. So there's our histidine chelating it on the bottom. Okay. Now, something we haven't mentioned at this point is what happens when oxygen comes in? Remember we said that um, anytime something, even as minuscule as a pro proton, binds to a protein, what happens? Changes conformation. So what do you think happens when oxygen binds? Right, it's changing conformation, right? So what ends up happening is when oxygen binds, to this iron, right? It just it doesn't actually bond, but it interacts with. When it interacts with this iron, what happens? Well, what happens is there is a very, 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 very minuscule movement of the histidine. Okay. In fact, it really, when you get down to it, it's only fractions of an angstrom. Very, very small change in the position of the histidine, right? Okay. So the histidine moves, right? Histidine is going to move a little bit, right? Well, what's the histidine attached to? It's attached to the protein chain, right? So now you've got this situation that's sort of like uh, the foot bone's attached to the ankle bone, which is connected to the shin bone, which is connected to the, you know, the upper leg bone and all that stuff. So if I move one residue, what happens to all the other residues? They move as well, right? Now here's the important consideration. This histidine right here in this porphyrin ring, it, we're just considering a sort of a part right here in this, in this globin, right? But remember that the globins are all connected, right? So if one globin changes conformation, what happens to the other three? They change conformations as well. So when the first oxygen binds, it changes the conformation of itself, and it also changes the conformations of all three other three globins, right? 
Does that make sense? All right? So if those globins change conformation, that's what makes it more favorable for other oxygens to bind. So then this oxygen binds, right? Then what happens? Conceptually, another change in conformation, right? Then the next oxygen binds, right? And then what happens? Then you have your final change in conformation, and then the last oxygen binds, right? So as each oxygen binds, there's more and more of a change in conformation, and therefore it makes it more likely for the next ligand, in this case oxygen, to bind, okay? And it all has to do with this histidine residue. When that oxygen binds to the iron, the histidine moves just a little bit. It's just fractions of an angstrom, but it moves enough to where it changes the conformation of the hemoglobin, okay? And we're assuming that when oxygen binds, we're in the R state, right? We're in the relaxed state, so we're able to bind to oxygen, right? And, um, and so forth, okay? So why is this important? Well, it's important when we look at saturation curves, okay? And so what you'll typically see with hemoglobin is they'll have something called a sigmoidal saturation curve. It's, it's percent saturation of oxygen, and these are actually really important. So what we're going to do is we're going to draw an axis. Right? And so right here, what we're going to have is we're going to have something called percent saturation. Okay. And that's percent. So we'll say this is 50. That's 100. And this is, of course, zero. And over here on the x-axis, we have partial pressure of oxygen. Okay. So I'm not going to draw numbers exactly, but effectively, you're going to have a curve that looks like this. Oops, let me redo that. So you're going to have something that looks like this, right? And you have this thing that looks like a sigmoidal curve. And sigma is the Greek letter, I believe, for S. So what you have is something that sort of resembles an S. So if we have another one, one's going to be like that. Then we have another one that's going to be a little bit higher, right? Well, what does this represent? Well, each one of these, um, each one of these curves represents a different pH. So this bottom one, and I'm getting this out of Leninger Principles of Biochemistry, 6th edition. The, what they have here is this is pH 7.2, this is 7.4, and this top one in green is 7.6. Okay? So what does this mean? Okay? It means that the curve shifts depending on what the pH is, right? Recall from our previous discussions that when, when um, that, that the histidine residues in the hemoglobin could bind protons, right? They were buffers, right? But remember, as the, pro as the protein binds things, it changes conformation that affects substrate binding, right? In this case, the ligand that's being bound is oxygen, right? So what we're about to discuss now is a very, very important uh, concept called the Bohr effect, okay? And again, this is actually a fairly poorly drawn uh, uh, figure, but I think you'll get the idea. Let's say that we have some fixed uh, partial pressure of oxygen, some fixed PO2, right? And so it, it, it's an iso it's isobaric, so we're, we're, we're assuming it's isobaric, meaning there's no change in pressure of oxygen. And what we can do is we can sort of draw a line up here at a constant pressure, and we can look at the percent saturation, okay? What, so we notice that we, and we draw lines over to figure out what the percent saturation is at each particular pH. Okay? What do you notice? What's happening at the lowest pHs? There's a lower percent saturation. Right? At pH 7.2, you see the lowest percent saturation. What about the highest pH, 7.6? It's the highest percent saturation. Right? You remember that, that picture that I drew in one of the previous videos, what happened? We had an actively metabolizing cell. We produce CO2 and what else? H3O plus, hydronium, right? So if we have lots of hydronium, we're, we're signaling that we have a metabolically active cell, right? We need more oxygen. And if you remember the previous videos, what did we talk about? When we need more oxygen, we want hemoglobin to dissociate the oxygen, right? It has to move into the, into the uh, T state, right? So if I have a lot of H3O+, plus, what happens to the pH? It drops, right? So this pH right here, 7.2, would be uh, representative of the, of the highest amount of hydronium, the highest concentration of, of hydronium in the blood, right? So what happens when you have low pH? 
Well, when you have low pH at constant PO2, right, you have lower percent saturation. This is an experimentally determined uh, relationship. When you have high hydronium concentrations, again, the histidines are binding the protons, hemoglobin changes conformation, what happens? It causes the, the uh, hemoglobin to move into the T state. What happens in the T state? Oxygen dissociates. So this effect right here where the pH shifts with changes, or excuse me, when the percent saturation changes with, with changes in pH, this is called the Bohr effect. The Bohr effect, okay? So the Bohr effect basically says that as the pH drops, the percent saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen also drops. Okay, so they have a direct relationship. Why is that? Well, when, when protons bind to histidine residues and, and within the, the protein itself, right, what happens? It favors the movement from the R state to the T state. What happens in the T state? Oxygen dissociates, right? So when you think of the Bohr effect, don't just memorize it. Try to reason through it. Again, all, mo pretty much what biochemistry is, it's, you're not really learning a whole lot that's new. You're just applying what you already know from Gen Chem and Organic, right? And, and maybe some other ones like P-Chem, right? So as you, if, if, if you are, have an actively metabolizing cell and the pH around the cell is dropping, you want more oxygen, right? Because you're actively metabolizing. So when the hydronium rises in the blood, it causes um, changes in the conformation of hemoglobin and the percent saturation of oxygen decreases. Why? Because you're moving from the R to the T state, right? So what happens at pH 7.6 when you have a higher pH? You more or less favor the R state, right? right? So if you have the T state in equilibrium with the R state, what happens if the pH rises? Favor the R state, right? So, so as you start to lower the pH, the percent saturation of hemoglobin by oxygen decreases. Okay, so this is a good this is good news if you're a furiously metabolizing cell because if the pH is dropping, that's the cell signaling, okay, we need more oxygen uh, to carry out synthesis of ATP. Right? If we need more oxygen, what happens? Percent saturation decreases due to changes from the R to the T state, right? And that happens as the pH lowers, and this, this uh, relationship between R and T state and the pH is referred to as the Bohr effect. And so what this means is that at constant pressure of oxygen, you can, you can effectively say that as the pH drops, percent saturation drops, okay? And remember to think about it in terms of Le Chatelier's principle and also from your own rational under, uh, point of view. Uh, rationalize through it. Don't just memorize it. Okay. And again, this is called the Bohr effect. And it all has to do with the cooperativity, right? And actually, one thing that's important to understand about cooperativity is remember that we said that in the case of hemoglobin, it's positive cooperativity, meaning that the binding of the first oxygen makes it more likely for the next one to bind. Okay. And whenever you have a relationship that's cooperative, what you end up generating is a sigmoidal curve. Okay. So um, when we get to enzyme kinetics um, and, and protein kinetics and so forth, we'll see that um, things that are not cooperative tend to have a hyperbolic curve. Things that are allosteric or cooperative tend to have a different looking curve. In some cases, they tend to have a sigmoidal curve. So at this point, it's probably a good idea now to define what allosteric means. An allosteric protein, and a lot of times in classes they say an allosteric enzyme, Certainly enzymes can be allosteric, but hemoglobin is allosteric and it's non-enzymatic. Allostery is basically when you have when you have a particular molecule that influences um, the binding of another one or the catalysis of an enzyme. Okay, and so there are positive allosteric modulators and there are negative allosteric modulators. Okay, if you have and a, a molecule that makes it less likely for another molecule to bind, it's a negative allosteric modulator, and I hope that makes sense. In the case of hemoglobin, these are positive allosteric modulators because the binding of one oxygen atom makes it more likely for the next oxygen to bind, so it's a, it's a positive allosteric modulator. And so all, the all, all allosteric 
uh, molecules do is they bind to a particular protein and they change the conformation to affect the binding. Okay, you'll talk about we'll talk about this more when we get to allosteric enzymes and enzyme kinetics and function and so forth. But suffice it to say for now, the allosteric modulators change the conformation of a protein to affect the binding of other molecules. Okay, now there are two types. Um, of allosteric modulators, uh, there's a, well, there's another classification besides positive and negative. There's homotropic and heterotropic. Okay, a heterotropic heterotropic allosteric modulators are the most common one. Heterotropic just means that the allosteric modulator is different than the actual ligand or substrate. So, for instance, an example of this to illustrate this would be um, if you have a reaction. Okay. If you have a reaction that goes A plus B to AB, right? And let's and so A and B will say are the substrates, right? Let's say we have allosteric modulator C, we have allosteric modulator A, we have allosteric modulator B, and allosteric modulator D. Okay, which ones are heterotropic? Well, a heterotropic modulator. Heterotropic modulator would be one that is different, a different molecule than what the substrate of the enzyme is or the ligand of the protein, right? So which ones are heterotropic? C and D, right? They're not the substrates of that particular enzyme, right? Homotropic would be if the, if the allosteric modulator was the same as the actual substrate or ligand, right? Which ones are homotropic? All right, it's A and B. Those are the homotropic ones. So is oxygen, if we consider hemoglobin allosteric, what type of ligand, what type of modulator is oxygen? It's positive modulator, positive allosteric modulator, and it's homotropic, right? Because it's homotropic because um, it's the modulator, but it's also the same as the actual ligand of hemoglobin. Okay? So... I hope this video helped you understand the Bohr effect and cooperativity. And what we'll do in the next video is we'll actually look at some mechanisms of enzymes. Um, we're going to look at one that we saw in the previous video, which was carbonic anhydrase. We're just going to try to get you at this point to be exposed to organic mechanisms and how they relate to biochemistry. See you in the next video.